Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. And today we have a follower favorite of mine. It's Mob Movie Monday. We're going to review the Lansky movie. Something a little special today. I'm going to be reviewing it with Meyer Lansky II, who's Meyer Lansky's grandchild. And good guy. I know him for a while. Lives in Vegas. And we're going to review the movie together. So be really interesting. Before we get to that, I want to thank everybody. We're at 600,000 subscribers. Couldn't do it without you enjoying the content and know we appreciate it. You have a lot of content on YouTube. The fact that you turned into ours, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. The crew is growing. Over 17,000 members. MichaelFrancis.com, our inner circle, growing daily. And we're doing something new now. We started it last Tuesday. We're going to be doing it, I believe, every Tuesday. And that's a live webinar. There's going to be a link you can jump on tomorrow. Today's Monday, tomorrow's Tuesday. You're going to get a lot out of it. I'm going to answer questions from those in the chat room. We're going to be sharing some wise guy wisdom, things from my past that I think will help you today and your present and in your future. So jump in. We had several hundred on the last call. We expect more tomorrow. So really that's it. And one of the most famous lines from any kind of gangster is, we're bigger than U.S. Steel. And you know who delivered that line? Meyer Lansky. So here we go. Let's watch the movie Lansky. Let's get into uh, the movie Lansky. It's on uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen it yet, you can tune in. Every Monday, I kind of review a movie. This one's different because your grandfather was the subject of the movie. And uh, obviously, it's somebody that you know and loved and cared about. So I want to get your perspective. We'll go over a couple of scenes, but I want to get your perspective on the movie uh, really in a general sense. Now, I know you told me you saw it three times, so you're pretty familiar with it. I watched it twice. And I got to say, I really enjoyed it. I really did. I thought Harvey Keitel did a great job. Uh, he was, you know, for me, the focus uh, of the movie. I thought he did a great job. What do you think? That's what attracted to me the most was uh, the trailer when I initially saw it. I didn't expect the movie actually to see the daylight. I We thought for a while, I heard about it three years ago and I said, oh, you know, a friend of mine said, maybe, maybe not. He hasn't done a movie before, so we'll see. Um, but when I saw the trailer that actually popped out to me is, uh, I didn't know any more about it than anybody else. I was very impressed. It sounded exactly, uh, he had the part down uh, as far as when I heard uh, when he was talking to David Stone, who was uh, a fictional character played by Sam Worthington. I don't want anything in that book to like, I mean, it sounded exactly like him. I was highly impressed. Um, I mean, Harvey is Jewish. He is about the same age as my grandfather at the end of his life. And uh, boy, he had that down real well. So I thought I was listening to my grandfather, to be honest with you, especially in the deli, because we were always in a deli when I saw him in uh, Miami Beach every year. So that would be the meeting place then. That, would that be was the pretty realistic. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, I thought that opening scene, I thought he was great in that. You're not going to reveal anything, you're not going to talk to anybody, and this book is not going to be revealed until I die. Um, and the way he delivered those lines was uh, was terrific. Spot on. He had some material to uh, study. There's a few videos of my grandfather online, close to that age anyway. When he walked into the deli, and it shows that scene, and people look they had the girls looking over and uh, indirectly but uh you get that sense of mystery that he carried mm -hmm. see he did have a sense shrouded in mystery all the time i don't know some people just have that when you're around him and he's talking to you you know there's more behind him than he displays there's just something about him it draws attention <laughs> it did draw attention right. Let me ask you, is there any truth to the fact that uh, your grandfather did sit down with a reporter? Uh, was there any truth to that at all? Or was that there was a little truth to that, and he decided not to. And uh, they went ahead and wrote the book anyway, I think, is how it went. It, yeah, he was going to do that towards the end of his life, so that it has a little bit of truth to it. And uh, then he decided not to do it. So 
let me get right to uh, a big fact in the movie, his relationship with Bugsy, Benny Siegel. You know, I, I got to tell you this. When you talk to guys like my father, who's, who's passed away now, and some of the, the guys in the life that I knew, and I ask them about Meyer, they kind of downplay his role. I think it's more of this Italian pride, you know, that, no, this was an Italian thing, and we created it all. And if you weren't Italian, you really didn't have as much juice as people say. And that goes for Maya Lansky also. But I kind of, you know, my research and my, you know, investigation of this over the years, that's not true. I think Meyer and Bugsy and Rothstein, I think they played a lot bigger part than some of the Italian guys from that life want to admit to. What do you think of that? Well, yes, I do. Uh, you know, when Luciano, my grandfather, and uh, Ben Siegel met and they all got together, the traditional part kind of, they Americanized it. You know, as I, I don't think they even called it the mafia anymore. They were just the Italians and uh, the Jews got together and it was just they benefited each other. So there was no reason. But, yeah, there was a lot of prejudice. But the interesting thing about it, they all worked together. They knew they had to work together for the greater good, which is can be a very difficult thing. But, yeah, I'm sure there was quite a few Italians who didn't like the idea of Jews coming into the uh, picture at the time. But. Luciano, my grandfather, he, he had a great respect for him instantly because they met over on Hester Street when, you know, the, in those days, the yeah, the Italian, Irish and Jewish sections and the Jewish guys uh, traditionally gave up their money. And, you know, they were intimidated. And my grandfather was. So they had an instant respect for each other. He was ready to throw down and said, you're not getting my money to cross this neighborhood. And uh, that's how it formed. That's how it started, you know. There's a scene in the movie, and this must be after Luciano created the commission. And we know we do credit him with that. That's a fact. But there is a scene in the movie when the Italians, Meyer Lansky, and they say even the Irish were sitting down at this syndicate, and they were the ones that were deciding what organized crime would be like in America. Coming to kind of current time, back in the 80s, I knew a few guys like, uh, you know, McIntosh, who was close with Carmine Persico. Obviously, Jimmy Burke was close with a lot of guys in that family. They weren't Italian, and they didn't have a seat at the table. They couldn't sit there because they weren't made guys in that life. I don't know if that scene was right or not, because I don't know that anybody would be able to be sitting at that table the Mafia Commission table, it really is only made up of mob guys, made men, I should say, the bosses of the families throughout the country. But on the other hand, I do believe, okay, that they did sit down together and they talked about policy and gambling and things that were happening during that time. So I believe Meyer played and the Jewish organized crime people played a bigger role than some made guys want to admit to. I think definitely so, you know, especially at their time when they created the American the syndicate, basically, with Lucky Luciano and Ben and my grandfather. I'm sure there was people that didn't like it, you know, but they were they were the top people, I believe. And my grandpa had Luciano's ear all the time. They were good friends. He was definitely uh, in on a lot of big decisions. You know, that's kind of been proven. What do you know about the relationship between Benny Siegel and your grandfather? Because they go way back, and in the movie, it portrays Bugsy as kind of the enforcer for your grandfather. Did you see it that way? Did you hear it being that way? Did your grandfather ever talk to you about it? No, I never actually talked to, to him about anything to do with his life in that, in that background. What I know from, you know, my father and I was uh, Millicent Siegel, who was Ben's youngest daughter. She passed away a year a few years ago. Yes, in the early days, he definitely was an enforcer for, for my grandfather. But Ben also had a lot of confidence. He wasn't just one-sided. You know, they always say, oh, my grandfather was the accountant. Well, all those guys knew odds. They all were good with accounting. Uh, you know, they tagged that to Myers a lot, but, you know, Ben knew odds. He knew finance. They, you know, my grandfather had to fight at one time also. They never say much about that. I mean, in his younger years, he had to stick up for himself physically, obviously. So, yeah, he was a street guy also. So, I imagine. Yes, yeah, at the one, at the early days. I mean, they all together, they met at the down on Delancey Street when the craps game went wrong and Ben grabbed a gun and was going to shoot an Irish police officer. And my grandpa said, throw it down. You're going to get arrested. He was, he actually was the only person he really listened to was my grandfather. So 
being a few uh, years older than he was, I think maybe had something to do with it. But Yeah, I just want to mention at this point that I don't know if I should say this with any amount of pride, but really the birth of Cosa Nostra, the mafia in this country, really happened in New York. That's where everybody that was anybody uh, right. pretty much came out of. Your grandfather, yes. Siegel, Luciano, Capone, all of those guys, they came out of New York. Yes. And they spread throughout the country. So, like I say, I don't know if I should say that with pride. Probably people would get mad at me, but, uh, you know, it's the Maybe truth. Maybe the guy's from Chicago. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, well, I don't know, know, probably not. Even some of the guys from Chicago originated from New York. That's right. I mean, that's where Capone came from. He was born in Brooklyn. So Right, right. That's true. Yes. And Johnny Torrio, you know. Exactly. Also came from New York. So so we could either we could either take the credit or the blame for that, you know, depending on how you look at it. That's true. No, I think New York's number one. Chicago and Jersey being the, you know, two and three, maybe. Let me ask you this, you know, one thing that was kind of heartfelt in the movie was your grandfather's feelings for Buddy. Yes. Who had cerebral palsy. Did you, what do you know about that? Every time I would go to Florida, I would stay with my uncle, buddy. Yes, he did have palsy. He was a very uh, personable person. He loved to gamble. He knew everybody. He was, uh, you know, he, he was kind of the face of the Hawaiian Owl Hotel. Everybody knew buddy. And my dad said if he uh, didn't have cerebral palsy, he probably could have been Hugh Hefner. He had a lot of girlfriends. He was <laughs> an exciting guy. I always stayed in his room. He had a room right by the office where he was a phone operator because that's, you know, it was easy for him to do. Boy, he'd be in his room for an hour or two and everybody would stop. He never knew. He never felt sorry for himself. He, he always uh, worked with people. He was very uh, uh, polite and uh, great guy. Even though you knew he was in pain, he was uncomfortable a lot of times. He, he never showed it. Never talked about it. Just a very uh, positive person. You know. Is he still alive? Oh, no, he died years ago. He died years 89, ago. 89, 89, yeah, I think. You know, in the movie, it's portrayed that your grandfather was, he was really hardened over the fact that Buddy had palsy. It, it kind of made him angry, kind of filled him with rage at times. Did you see it that way? No, you know, it was uh, difficult for him. I mean, we're, you're talking about the 40s. There wasn't a lot of... Uh, let, Things we know today, medically, that, you know, they didn't have compliance and businesses and things like they do today. You had to kind of work around that if you were going to go somewhere, theater, a game. Uh, but, uh, no, he never was really angry. He, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, there was a, uh, some knowledge that my grandmother said, it's your fault, Meyer, because of your lifestyle that our son is this way. That did happen years ago, but he got over that and uh, just got on with the slide, basically, so. Yeah, that was, a, uh, that was a very moving, emotional scene in the movie when, you know, his wife uh, really blamed him for Buddy's cerebral palsy right. because of the lifestyle that he lived. And, and obviously, you know, your grandfather in the movie got very upset about that, and I, I, I certainly can understand that. Sure, you know, that actually happened. He did have a breakdown. He went to Boston for a few weeks, and then he came back with his you know, mind clear of it, or at least uh, learn how to live with it, <laughs> I should say. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they also show in the movie that uh, when he was talking to the reporter, your grandfather, and the reporter kind of suggested that maybe this was God's will that Buddy was afflicted with cerebral palsy, and your grandfather got very upset, like he had no belief in God. He made a joke out of it. God, 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 like he was calling him, and God didn't answer. But in reality, your grandfather was, he was Jewish, like yourself, and he was a person of faith. He was a person of, I, I can't say faith. He never really talked about religion or anything to do with God. Uh, I do know that he was open to everything. You know, they had uh, Christmas, they had Easter, they celebrated everything. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to my dad. My dad and my uncle and even my aunt, they never went to Bar Mitzvah or the temple or anything. You know, he was a Jew, but he wasn't, I can't say a religious Jew by any yeah. means. You know, he was open to everything. In fact, you see pictures of him with Christmas tree behind him. And I think he's oh, really? celebrating Chris, Christian uh, holidays more than actually really? Jewish sometimes. So, uh, That's yeah, interesting. It, it is. Yeah. And I came up with that also, you know, so my father was uh, open to all that as well because he didn't really have a great Jewish upbringing. He said he was in a temple once, I think. That was it. So surprisingly, I'm sure people don't think of it that way. But. So let me ask you again, you know, when we're talking about the movie and, uh, you know, separated fiction from reality, 
they, they really portrayed him as a cold-hearted gangster. I mean, he was a killer in the movie. Did you see it that way? You no, think that was... no that, that's total uh, <laughs> not true at all. Obviously, he knew, uh, you know, that his partners, and including Ben, you know, had ways of getting results. He never was a part of that. No, he uh, was helpful to people. But he was aware. He knew what went on. Personally himself, no, he was very helpful to people. He wanted to see people progress and do well. And, you know, if you look at his clubs in that, uh, Around the time that Ben was building the uh, Flamingo here in Las Vegas, he was back in Florida. And uh, like I was saying, with the communities, he didn't want average people to gamble because he knew that would cause problems with wives and kids. And he didn't want average people losing their money. He just wanted the wealthy that wanted to gamble to be there. So he steered them away from all that. You know, he didn't allow prostitution inside his clubs because that would bring federal problems. He's just very logical and, and smart, you know. If everybody benefited, there would be, you know, it would help his business as well as everybody else. So. Yeah, I believe that. And there is a scene in the movie where Meyer is basically telling his crew or his associates there that somebody owes your money. We don't want to beat him up anymore. We want to help him pay us. And he was kind of turning, you know, that thuggery of the street life into more of a business type of operation. And I believe that. I believe that of him. And I, that was smart, obviously. That's true, obviously. Yeah, I, you know, and I have many stories. My father used to tell me in the 40s in New York, and uh, they'd be walking down the street, and all of a sudden your grandpa would go over and talk to somebody. He saw it. You'd see him take some money out of his pocket and give it to the guy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my dad's observation when he was 13, 14 years old. He saw that many times and uh, very helpful. There was one scene in the movie that I especially didn't like, and uh, they had somebody out on the forest or whatever, and they were executing him, and his wife was pleading for mercy, and they executed him in front of his wife. And I almost got personally offended by that because I can tell you, we didn't act that way, and I'm sure your grandfather didn't act that way. It was just a bad portrayal, in my view. Yeah, I think the same. I can't really get around that. That wasn't very, uh, that, that was nothing like him, first of all. That's artistic lies that that went a little far for me too yeah you know i know that that never happened so one thing that i do think was true the government the fbi justice department was after your grandfather for most of his adult life and they were never able to catch up with him now i got to tell you you know that doesn't happen by accident your grandfather had to be pretty shrewd pretty smart they were trying to track his holdings in European countries that he had, you know, gambling operations. Do you know that to be a fact? Did he have gambling operations in Europe that he controlled or owned? For a short time, I believe in England he, or London, they tried, he had something. You know, a lot of the stuff was, I don't know, any more than anybody else. I think that's true. Yes. A lot of that money was in cash. I know his biggest love was Cuba. He wanted that to really go over well. Vegas, he was, you know, removed from here. His brother was out here, my uncle Jack to watch over things, but uh, he really liked Florida and Cuba was his dream to have. Yeah, that would have yeah, well, Las Vegas if that would have gone over without, you know, Castro coming in. But uh, yes, he was, you know, Monte Carlo, uh, UK, worldwide interest in gambling. You know, some were bigger than others, obviously, and some lasted longer. There was a scene when uh, Meyer was walking with an emissary from Batista who was going to be the president. And they were telling him they wanted him to take over gambling operations in Cuba uh, because it would be legalized. And I believe there was a lot of truth to that. And your grandfather did play a principal role in Cuba during that time before Castro uh, took over, you know, with the revolution. You know, what, what do you know about that? Well, he did. And, uh, you know, he was there prior to 1957 with uh, Batista because Batista was there twice. He loved the Cuban people. He loved the fact that it wasn't the United States. He didn't like accounting to, yeah, that's one of the reasons he wasn't real prominent in Vegas or the United States. You know, he liked his business kept quiet and he didn't want people investigating him. So Cuba was a perfect place for him at that time. 57, when he built the Habana Riviera. And then, of course, a few years later, he had Fidel Castro take over. He had a great three years. Think about it. It wasn't longer. That was his dream to be there and on the Caribbean. And he, I think he just liked the East Coast, too. That was a big part of him, where Ben came out West, and he was more versatile in that way than my grandfather was. He liked staying back East. Well, I think it's, uh, it's too bad that Castro ever did take over, because we probably would have had, we probably would have owned all of Cuba as far as the gambling operations are concerned, because uh, they wanted us there, you know? They loved yes. the fact that we were there running things, so that was a... Uh, 
uh, that was a real setback, I would say, for organized crime. But uh, but back then, but in uh, in Cuba, it wasn't organized crime; it was legit. It was legitimate. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah I mean, what, if you look at uh, boy, what's not to like about Cuba? <laughs> you know, that yeah. would have been, uh, it, and it helped people again. He had Cuban dealers were some of the best dealers around, and they would go between. Uh, the, it was seasonal, you know, so they would go between uh, Cuba and then come out to Vegas and then back to Cuba. So, you know, he, he, he opened schools to, to teach them mm-hmm. how to deal and uh, all, all kinds of, he employed a lot of them. So that was a wonderful thing. He loved the Cuban families. He thought they were yeah. very good people. And yeah. Let me ask you this, in the movie, and I don't think this is accurate, maybe you know more than me, uh, they have your grandfather uh, being the one that started Murder Incorporated, that he was the force behind the formation of Murder, Inc., which, as you know, Lepke was part of that, and uh, a few of the Jewish guys, you know, a couple of Italian guys also won't go through it. I, did, I actually did a video on this once before, but uh, I never heard that Meyer was the one that formed that, so I think that's another thing in the movie that's not accurate. Right. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Uh, well, you had Albert Anastasia. I think right. uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, they needed a law enforcement arm because the uh, public was getting pretty, uh, I think, more in Chicago than New York during Prohibition. There was yeah. bodies piling up and they just couldn't have that anymore, you know, especially after the Valentine's Day massacre. I think that, yeah, you know, that was a real problem. So they had to find it a more efficient way. Let me clarify, Murder, Inc. was real. I mean, there was no question about that. The only thing I'm questioning is the, the fact that in the movie, your grandfather was portrayed as the person that started it, that he got his Jewish friends together like Lepke and, and Book Walter, and, uh, and they started it. But you're right, Anastasia was a big part of that. It definitely existed, but I don't think your grandfather should be credited with forming it. No, no I don't think so either. That just wasn't yeah. within him. Yes. You know, I know one thing that I do believe that was really hurtful to your grandfather was the fact that he did support Israel. It's shown like that in the movie. I had heard that, that he was a, a supporter. I saw there was one scene in the movie when an emissary from Golda Meir asked for donations to fight off what was happening uh, with the Germans at the time was beginning, and your grandfather did support that effort. Do you know that to be a fact? Yes, he did. Uh, he did support Israel in a lot of ways, uh, philanthropy locally in Miami to, uh, yes, sending guns their way when they needed them. He did a lot for them. Yeah. And they uh, they wouldn't give him the law of return. Um, it was kind of interesting after he was on his deathbed in Miami. My father happened to be there. and My dad had written a letter to the government saying, you know, how you want what you want from my dad, but then you won't let him be fair. You know, he was pretty mad about that. And I guess a couple of Jewish rabbis came in on his deathbed. And my dad said that he wanted him to leave. You're not going to get him after he's dead if you don't want him when he's alive. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Just for the viewers, the uh, in Israel, there is the law of return that any Jewish person is allowed to return to Israel uh, and stay there through their through, you know, through the time that they died so they can be buried there. Right. And in the movie, and I think there is truth to this. Uh, your grandfather to kind of escape investigation. They knew he knew things were getting hot here in the United States. He went to Israel and expected to have their support because of the law of return number one, and because he was a a great supporter when Golda Meir asked him to be. And then uh, the way it's told in the movie, and I think there is truth to this, uh, Golda Meir was looking for help from President Nixon at the time. And Nixon agreed to support Israel. One of the factors would be that your grandfather had to be deported back to the United States for prosecution. And I think that was accurate. Yeah, that was that was accurate. Actually, the first time I ever, you know, before when I was 10, 11 years old, my grandfather would come out to visit. We'd go back there. My parents would explain him as he's a great businessman. And sometimes uh, so around 12, 1970, he had to leave Israel. And I remember Walter Cronkite every night for about four nights saying, Meyer Lansky tried to get off in Venezuela and right back on the plane. And there was about six different countries that he tried to get off in. And and he ended up back in Miami Beach. And I'm trying to ask my parents, what's going on here? You know, because I'm like, I'm about 12. And they said, oh, they do that sometimes. They try to harass people and have money and are known in the public. And, you know, that's when I really got interested in digging deeper to find out what he was about. The movie says this. You think he had $300 million stashed away in foreign banks and everywhere else? 
I think at one time he probably had the equivalent to that. Uh, you know, a lot of the, everything he did was on a cash basis, along with all those other guys at that time, the old school guys. They didn't invest. He didn't like Wall Street. He didn't invest in things a yeah, little bit, but he didn't trust that. You know, most right. of the money was in cash. And yeah, it was in a Swiss bank at one time, I think. Uh, he lost a lot of money in Cuba. And then he had 10, 15 years of lawyer's fees and my uncle. And uh, I think a lot of that money uh, was just spent in the end, to be honest. Yeah. The movie doesn't show his death, obviously. I think he's walking along the beach at the end of the movie, if I remember. It goes on, there was some graphic, I don't remember what it said, but you were close to him up until the time he passed away. Any parting words, anything of interest that he might have said or you might want to reveal? Or, Well, you know, he did. One time he, uh, he was not, uh, he had a few years left and I was probably in my early 20s. I remember talking to him and saying, uh, boy, uh, that's going to be great. I'm going to make a lot of money, and you know, with this new career. And he, and he said, you know, he looked at me and seriously, and he said, he said, Meyer, there's a lot more to life than money. He says, uh, read a few, you know, write a few letters, read a few good books, have a few good friends. What more do you want out of life? Hmm. And I, now that I look back on that as a 64-year-old man, I said, yeah, he's, you know, he, that, that's what he ended up. That was the more happy points of his life than just the money. I think you he think, was revealing uh, his real feelings about life itself at that point. Did you get the feeling that he was expressing any kind of regret for the life that he lived? I don't know so much. Of reg- yeah, I think there's probably parts that he was uh, regretful for. Now, would he have taken a whole different avenue? Probably not. I think he was built to be what he was. He could have done it at that time. It was proof of they had the Jewish Alliance down in the old part of or the uh, Lower East Side of, the, of uh, New York City, where a lot of the people at the same time went on to be great scientists and lawyers and doctors. And he chose a different way. He could have done that. He expressed mm-hmm. his interest in being an engineer because he enjoyed figures, of course, but uh, he took a different road, you know, so. Well, let me ask you this. So uh, were you with him when he passed away? I wasn't. I actually missed it. I was in Seattle and my grandmother from the other side of my family called me and said, your grandfather passed away. And I'd been working late that night. And I go, why? And I, so I, I went back to bed. I turned on the TV about an hour later and there he was. Yeah. So, and, you know, I, uh, they buried him within 24 hours. I didn't make it. So I went afterwards, you know. But, right. Yeah. Do you think he died peacefully? I mean, was he content at the end of his life? He was, uh, I, I don't think anybody was bothering him with respect to law enforcement at that point in time. He kind of settled in and just lived out his life. Well, they said at the very end, uh, my, my dad uh, had just left, actually. He wasn't there at the very end. But uh, he said, let me go, let me go. That was his last words. They were really? trying to save him, and he didn't want to be saved. Really? And wow, that's interesting. Go, so, which, uh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. This was great, Maya. I really appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to it. Next time I come into town, I'll give you a call. We'll okay. go for that steak dinner. All right, we're good. Thank you All so right, much. All right, brother. You Talk take you care. Through. God bless, and uh, I'll see you the next time. Okay. Thanks, All man. right. Bye-bye now. Bye now. So there you have it. I think that's uh, probably one of the most honest, realistic reviews you're going to get, uh, you know, because obviously Meyer Lansky II knew his grandfather fairly well, and he was able to debunk some of the things that were shown in the film Lansky. Again, Harvey Keitel did a great job. Uh, you know, he was brilliant as far as I was concerned. Everybody did a pretty good job, but, um, you know, understand in all of these movies, they embellish things quite a bit, and the way uh, Lansky was portrayed in this was obviously not the same as his grandson described him. So remember, whenever you see these movies, they are embellished a little bit, but hey, that's Hollywood. They try to make it a little bit more interesting, a little more entertaining. I like what Meyer II said at the end. His grandfather was an affable type of guy. He was into sports, loved to go out and eat, loved his grandchildren. You know, sometimes the media and movies portray guys from my former life as, you know, just thugs. All we were were gangsters 24-7. And that's not true. You know, we had families, we enjoyed things. And I said it during the review, my dad the same way. 
he was who he was in that life, but he also, you know, enjoyed life on the other side of it. So, and I was the same way. When we were a part of that life, we did what we had to do, but we also enjoyed our families, we enjoyed activities and things like that. So, watch the movie if you haven't seen it yet. If you're in my crew, we're going to post it or put it in there so you can watch it. If not, it's on Amazon Prime. You could either rent it or buy it, but I think you'll enjoy it. It was fairly well done. So that's it for today. How do I always leave you? Be safe. Be healthy, God bless, and yes, I will see you next time.